As we work to address the lack of trust in public health, it's important to encompass all the factors that contribute, from addressing myths to improving equitable access to services. There's a lot to be done. We're joined now by Reed Tuxen, who's working to bring together all of the stakeholders to make this happen. Dr. Tuxen, thank you so much for being Pleasure. here. Pleasure. Pleasure to be with you. So talk to me a little bit about this lack of trust and how it manifests itself and how important it is to identify it. What we are seeing is that the consequences of this erosion of trust in health professionals, in, um, in our science in establishment, means that people are not as willing as we wish they were to follow and use evidence in making personally appropriate health choices and decisions for themselves, their families, and unfortunately for the communities in which they live. So what we are seeing now are people who for a variety of reasons are choosing to take uh, positions or not to do things that they should do um, based on faulty information and faulty allegiances to uh, individual tribes that seem to care more about their tribal affiliation, their political affiliation, their political agenda than they do towards whether or not uh, we have the chance to prevent uh, illness and p allow people to survive. And really, we saw it manifest itself terribly during COVID, and people were dying because of this mistrust. And you experienced that a little bit, the Black Coalition Against COVID. On Easter Sunday 2020, when we first looked at the data and could see and start to realize how serious this was going to be, um, I drew upon my experience as being the commissioner of public health in Washington, D.C., during the height of the AIDS epidemic, like 40 years ago. And what I really remembered and wished that I had uh, was a organized community infrastructure to partner with government. So we had a top down, bottom up. And so I took on the assignment of, let's see if we cannot organize uh, the minority community in Washington, D.C. Ultimately, we began to realize that this is going to require vaccines, which meant clinical trials, which meant overcoming all of those hurdles. And so as a result, we made the movement national. And we brought in the four black medical schools, Howard, Meharry, Morehouse, and Drew, the National Black Medical Association, the National Black Nurses Association, and, and others. And together, we were able to now mobilize this conversation with the black community using the most trusted of our health leadership in partnership with community uh, organizers, in partnership with our faith-based elements, in partnership with our social and fraternal organizations, all coming together as a, as a collective group working in harmony to try to give our community uh, not only the best information, but also to show that in fact, the guidance and advice was trustworthy coming from places uh, that they can feel confident in. But I know it didn't happen overnight. It was a real journey. Tell me about the Coalition for Trust in Health and Science and how that played a role. After the pandemic was over, we had a chance to look up over the barricades of the fight. And, and it was very interesting to us to realize that, first of all, that the black community was able to close a disparities gap for the first time as represented by primary series COVID vaccinations. But secondly, we realized that black life expectancy the second year was better actually than white America. And that showed us that this issue of distrust, misinformation, uh, was not an African-American or minority community issue, it was an American issue. And so the question we asked ourselves, is it possible for the first time in history to bring together the entire health ecosystem end to end to fight this existential threat, which is a fundamental threat to the missions of every health organization uh, and also a fundamental threat to the, to the oaths that we take as health professionals. I'm happy to report that from a standing start with no money, no staff, 90 plus organizations that do represent the entire spectrum of the ecosystem from basic science, uh, health services research, hospitals, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, regulatory agencies, the public health agencies, consumer agencies, ethics institutes, you name it, all the way across the spectrum have now come together under the banner of the Coalition for Trust in Health and Science. What a gargantuan task that you achieve. How can APHA help? Well, first of all, it is wonderful that APHA is a founding member, an original member, um, and, and, and I'm very pr pleased with that. I think the most important thing we have to remember is, as we are speaking now, Across this country, there are hundreds of thousands of professionals in one discipline or another in healthcare, either enrolling someone in a clinical trial, someone who is organizing a community town hall uh, uh, as a public health engagement, a physician in, a, in the, in the uh, therapeutic arena giving the guidance for the therapeutic plan. All these people are touching 
millions and millions of Americans today. We have to make sure that every one of those touch points is a trust enhancing touch point, one that gives us the opportunity to not only provide information, but provide it in a way that people will be able to have confidence and use it. So APHA really needs to continue on making sure that we are being allegiant to our responsibility to make sure that we are always putting trust at the, at the forefront of what we do. And I think also what we have to do is to start now to have a new relationship with many of our communities. Let's be frank and honest. There are too many American communities that are not listening to us, and we're going to have to have a different conversation in a different way, in different formats. And APHA is gonna to need to be a leader in that effort. Yeah, keep the good going. Dr. Tuxen, thank you so much. Thank you, appreciate it.